Welcome, everyone, to another episode of the Campus Waterfowl Podcast. I'm your host, Derek Christians, and on this episode, I am here for a collegiate waterfowl tour at Mississippi State University in Starkville, Mississippi. All right. Here we are. (laughs) It is, unfortunately, the last weekend of duck season. It's been a long season. This is stop number 10, only 10. So typically, we do 12 trips on our collegiate waterfowl tour, but um, we kind of got a late start to the season this year. So we're going to extend the tour into conservation season. So hopefully get on a couple trips this spring and go after some snow geese. So um, for sure. Yeah, I mean, I'm looking forward to it. It'll be a, a fun, a little uh, fun couple trips, I think. And yeah. we've never done it for a tour. So um, why not this season? Yeah, so, might as well. Right. So um, if you guys are listening to the podcast, um, this is on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, all those streaming platforms. But we also record it on uh, YouTube, and then also you can actually watch the video on Spotify as well. But um, if you're watching on YouTube, take it on the road if you if you can't finish the podcast. But um, if you're watching, we're kind of this is probably our most elegant scene of all of our college trips. <laughs> we're here <laughs> at one of the, their colleagues' places, where it's probably is it? Would you say it's the cleanest of all the places? You you'd have to think. Yeah, you'd, you'd, I mean, you'd, you'd have to think. My place is pretty squeaky clean, if you can believe it from looking at me. But uh, <laughs> uh, no, nah, Betsy Betsy is a great decorator. She she, is. Uh, she can do it well. Yeah, it's definitely your. It's it's not the typical like college decor that I suspect. No, not your, your, not yeah. for, for this group. Yeah. Yeah. For for me, whenever I was here. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. But so to kind of introduce our guests lightly. So to my right here, we got Drew Hunter, and then we actually have a special guest joining us, uh, Dr. Mike Brazier with Ducks Unlimited, who is back in his alma mater at Mississippi yeah. State. He did yeah, his undergrad right. here. Yep. Is this so, where I say Hell State? Yep. I, I think that so. Absolutely. Once, right? <laughs> They'll stay and go dogs. <laughs> That's right. So it's, it's fun to have him here. He's actually, um, since our kind of um, – since Campus Waterfowl became a part of Ducks Unlimited, this is actually our first time actually having someone a part uh, of DU on one of these trips. So it's an, I'm excited that for, for Mike to be here and kind of get to witness wh- what we've been doing these last three seasons. Yeah, yeah it's <laughs> so. an honor, man. It's, it's cool. I'm glad to be part of it. I guess before we get into the podcast, we do got to thank some sponsors here. Um, so none of this would be possible without our sponsors. The first one we get to kick off is Kent Cartridge. You guys are all, all familiar uh, with Kent Cartridge. They, they supply the ammo for these students every weekend. Uh, they came out with their new Fast Steel Plus stack load. So this weekend, uh, hopefully we can get on them. And we'll be, done, we'll be talking about that, our hunt for this weekend a little bit in the podcast. But we'll be using their 2-4 stack loads. Uh, the other sponsor is Benelli USA, who, if you guys have been following SHOT Show, they released their, and kind of are sharing a lot about their Benelli, their new Benelli M2 model. Uh, there's some different kind of specs and little features on this new M2, so we actually have some of those with us this weekend as well for the students to try. Um, and I don't know if you guys are already shooting Benelli's or not. What do you yeah, think? I got a uh, Super Black Eagle 3 and XX4, so yeah. I will take both of them in the morning. So. There we go. We'll I see. primarily shoot Franke 12 gauge, so uh, Franke Affinity, but uh, yeah. Nice, nice. Uh, but yeah, we got those options if, if they want to give those a try. But all right, enough of the intro stuff. Let's get into the podcast. So uh, Drew, you want to start us off? Yeah, so my name is Drew Brown. I'm from Columbus, Mississippi, 45 minutes down the road. I've... um. Pretty much coming out of high school, I pretty much knew I was coming to Mississippi State, and I uh, started duck hunting three years ago. Um, come a long way since then. Very blessed to be able to do what I do, and glad I can share others share it with other people. All right, my name's Hunter Yelverton. I'm uh, originally from Brandon, Mississippi, which is in the Jackson, Mississippi area. Uh, I actually did not know I was coming to Mississippi State until right at the last minute. I grew up a uh, group of fan of another school up north. We we don't. <laughs> uh, we don't like to talk about too much, but, uh, yeah, when, all, when you talk to my high school friends and about where I went to college, that it shocked them at the time, but now it just, I love it here. And, uh, so I, I chair the Ducks Unlimited chapter here at Mississippi State. I've been involved with it for about three years now. And, and so, yeah. And me, I'm Dr. Mike Brazier. I'm the senior waterfowl scientist for Ducks Unlimited. I've worked for DU 18 and a half years now. I was in Louisiana for a number of years, 13 or so years, and moved to Memphis in the current position I'm in, um, whatever that would be, five years or so ago. And this is an amazing opportunity for me to be part of this with you, Derek, uh, Campus Waterfowl. And 
um, Drew and, and Hunter, you guys also, it's, it's just so cool. I mean, to have the opportunity to come back and spend this time with folks half my age, (laughs) (laughs) um, but doing the things that I love to do on a sort of a different platform, um, getting the exposure that campus waterfowl is providing is just so amazing. And, and I'm, uh, like I said, beginning honored to be the first DU staff uh, on campus waterfowl and to have it occur at my alma mater is very, very special. So it's, it's cool. Thanks for having me yeah, here. We're excited to have you here. I mean, really appreciate you making the trip down. Yeah. Mississippi state's been kind of a college. I've been one to come for, come to for many years. Um, so campus waterfall started in 2014 and, I would say some of the earliest pictures that would kind of we share and get sent into or get sent in by were from Mississippi State. And actually, one I do want to give a shout out to one of the first interns of Campus Waterfall back in 2014, 2015, roughly when we were getting off, um, getting going, was uh, Logan Smith, who I think mm-hmm. I think he was involved with the DU chapter down here. That, that um, rings a bell. Yeah. And yeah, he was one of our first interns. So big shout out to to Logan. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. Derek, the one thing that I forgot to say in my introduction is that one of the other roles that I found myself doing now is co-host of the Ducks Unlimited podcast, That's right? right. <laughs> and so we're, we're sort of a little collaboration here on the Campus Waterfowl podcast, DU podcast. Um, and and thank you to you guys for your, your volunteerism supporting Ducks Unlimited. Uh, I tell everybody all the time that Ducks Unlimited doesn't exist without our members and especially without our volunteers. The amount of time and effort that y'all put in, it's it, it's very humbling and much, much appreciated. I was a volunteer for the, for the, I think the Starkville chapter and the Mississippi State chapter whenever I was here. And so it's great that we still have all that mm-hmm. going. Yeah, I definitely enjoy getting involved. Uh, when I started, the, I got involved with DU probably my sophomore year of high school. And at that time, my family didn't do it on duck hunting. Uh, I kind of got into it through people I'd met through DU. So, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's, I've loved building this community and being a part of it and seeing where it's taken me. So, yeah. Since we have Mike here, who's, it's been a while since he's kind of hunted these same grounds that he used to when he was in undergrad. Um, and I think it's pretty, uh, comparable to even other college campuses around the country, just how fast these different, these types of landscapes change over time. So I kind of want to kind of get your guys' feel of what it's like hunting in this area and then kind of get Mike's even input on on how things have changed in his his eyes. um, Well, I think it's changed a lot from – we were sitting down at lunch today and uh, Dr. Mahi said, he asked me how many black ducks we (laughs) killed. And I looked at him and I was like, "Uh, man, not that many. Uh, But then you were honest with me and said, you've never seen one, right? Yeah, I've I've never (laughs) seen, seen one fly over. I heard of one being killed. Now, if they were lying a lot, you know, honestly, I don't know. But they said that they had um, killed one down here. And, um, but that that's all I've heard of. Like, it's it's crazy because where, where we're hunting tomorrow is, um, I mean, it's been around forever. And we'll get into that, I'm, I'm sure, later on. But um, they said that I talked to some of, some of the older guys that had been hunting. He said when, when they used to hunt in there, they said they'd kill, I mean, 10 12 15 black ducks a year and now i mean it's if you see one i feel like you've done something down here it's just the flyways are always changing they're always birds are doing different things always and it's constantly adapting um but now we're having to adapt it so yeah it, it's interesting to to see it's, it's kind of funny when you ask me how many black ducks we killed <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think that's one of the things that makes our sport so incredible, though, is, is you have to learn to adapt year after year after year. Uh, it's not just these long-term sort of shifts you see. It's, it's it's something different you're dealing with every year, and I think that's what you, it's a really – you really do have to be sort of intelligent and, and sort of smart about how you go about these things. So that's what makes it so incredible and in seeing everything, too. So, yeah. And I think that's a good point. And, and good hunters are ones that adapt, mm-hmm. and they'll – there will be ones that adapt over multiple years, but also that will adapt within a given year, right? Because your weather conditions change from mm-hmm. one week to the next. We've already kind of talked about talked some of that. Right. You, know? yeah. you ain't lying. <laughs> we yeah. was yeah. it? La- lying. we had an in-depth week. discussion about yeah. that over dinner. So. Oh, yeah. 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 So uh, 
that is the very thing. You know, a lot of people will will say that 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 ducks are doing or that that migration has changed or something of that nature. I forget exactly the word that's most common. But maybe the migration is changing. What I like to do is say, well, the phenomenon of of migration has not changed. What is changing are those aspects of the environment and of the landscape that birds are responding to. The process of migration is this, is the same, but where they go, when they go and the, and and the timing that they that they go there, those things are or what's changing My, and those are in response to all these other things on the, on the landscape i feel like migra- migration is always going to happen they have they have to push down and i mean you i mean up north like i mean honestly if i was up north and i didn't have to move down no right why why would i fly all the way down here so i mean you can't really get mad at it because there's no there's no reason for them to push down yeah, right now that's right and i'll say this um duck hunt's growing man like I remember my senior year of high school, like, it was me and one other buddy. Like, that was it. Like, everybody duck hunting. And I work at a hunting store in Columbus now. And, I mean, which I, I think is a good thing, but, like, ninth, tenth graders, I mean, you have, like, boats. And, like, they're going every day. So, like, it's good for the sport. Like, I, I it's good everybody's going to do it. It's such a fun thing to do. Like, I, I, I hope everybody gets to experience what I've personally have experienced. But, um pressure is involved in that too yeah Yeah, so then you have to put that into account but it it really is it's growing so that's interesting to hear you say that you know and i'm i'm a big data person and we look at the data and some states you look at hunter numbers and they're going up most states and then when you look at them over all states combined hunter numbers are going down what's interesting and what well what would be interesting to dig into, and I don't know if the numbers are out there right now, but to see how sort of the age demographic is mm-hmm. changing. I mean, we knew that we, we knew we were facing this situation where most of the hunters at one point in time were in this aging sort of um, the, the, this age bracket, and they're getting older, and then once they get to about 70 years old, they really they start to, to drop mm-hmm. out, right? But then well, what's and so that's why a lot of these recruitment, retention, reactivation efforts have been put into place. What is that dim, earlier, that younger age demographic, the number of hunters? Mm-hmm. What does it look like? Is it growing? Mm-hmm. Sounds like you you think ex- it is based on oh, what yeah. you're seeing. It's exploding. I mean, I mean, I even talk to like my dad and some of his friends all the time, and and they say compared to what duck hunting and and what other waterfowl hunting is now, it just was wasn't at least in the in the Jackson area growing up wasn't nearly as big of a thing as, as it is now. now especially young people, it's, it's, it's exploding. Why do you think that is? I just think what it's would ex- be your hypotheses? Mm. If I, had to I just think it's, it, well, it I think it's an exciting sport. I mean, uh, I know a lot of people, I think deer hunting has kind of been the king around mm-hmm. Mississippi for a long time. And I think a lot of people like duck hunting or a lot of young people, especially cause they can get out, they can kind of talk and, and kind of, I don't know. It's a lot more. You can be a lot more loose with it. You can go have. You know, there's sort of an art to calling ducks too. That's that. That's a whole nother sort of trick to learn. So I think it's. A, there's a lot of excitement to it that uh, that gets young people kind of into it. So I love to see it. Yeah. They said over in Starful, oh, over in the refuge. You know, you can only hunt at certain days. But they said, I people come in store all the time. Yeah, we're gonna head out of the refuge in an hour. It's five thirty. I mean, they're going to spend the night, which, like, I can't say. Oh, 5.30 oh, in, the in the afternoon. Yeah. In the afternoon. Yeah. Yeah. They're going and stacking up trucks, and they said it is an all-out war every day no at the refuge kidding. to go hunt, which it was it never. Was good. Yeah, yeah we, but we never did that. Like, five, six years I ago, I feel like that's unheard of. Mississippi State's a big community for that, too. I, I guess with a lot of the, the ag people and the and the wildlife and biology background we have here, uh I hear about I, I know out of state students that come from all over the country and they say, well, I came to Mississippi State because I, well, I want to go to school, but I want to go hunt the Mississippi Delta on the weekends and wow. stuff. So it's a it's a there's a ton. The, the community is great down here. It's incredible. That's so, awesome to yeah. hear. Yeah. You know, Derek, what I what I would say, um, I, I I think back to, I think back to my time whenever I was here and the people that we hunted with. There was a core group of us, and we were. We were pretty hardcore, um, but we would never did the 5:30 p.m. type thing. Oh yeah, we didn't. We didn't have to. And I don't even remember. I don't what the like the the hunt opportunities out at Knoxville were. Um, 
it's been it's it's been a while since I since I was here, but uh, we had a pretty small group, you know, that would hunt, and we just we didn't hear a lot about it. Of course, mm-hmm. social media and the the way people communicate has cha- campus waterfowl. Right, right? That was, like, I was just going to ask this. This is pre yeah, social right? media. Yeah. That's well, right. Well, that's been one thing that's helped it blow up so much. I think is is the explosion of media along with hunting. I mean, even guys as big as like you know the the robertsons and stuff helped duck hunting just explode yeah. in the yeah. last decade all the way down to you seeing your buddy on instagram you know going out with all his friends you think yeah. oh i want to i want to do that that looks fun yeah, so. mm-hmm. i asked students last weekend uh, at, when at nc state and ecu um if they're if a lot of people involved with their chapter or just people that they know are you are, do you see a lot of people your peers uh, even traveling out of state or even just willing to travel for different I types got, of hunts? I got buddies up in Arkansas right now. Mm-hmm. Really? They, they uh, He called me today. He's like, you going in more? I was like, yeah, we're going to try it. He said, we just crossed the Arkansas state line. Mm-hmm. So, I mean. You're one of them out of staters. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, and it's crazy because in the boat ramp, we'll see it in the morning. The past couple times we've hunted is there's been seven or eight trucks from Alabama mm-hmm. driving. I mean, it's. There's out-of-state people coming here. I, I know that sounds crazy because as terrible as the weather's been and the hunt has been down here, it's, I say terrible, and ain't been bad, but, I mean, it's crazy to see how many people are traveling to come here, not people traveling to go hmm. other places. When I was, uh, I lived in North Carolina this summer. I was working there this summer, and uh, I had friends I was working with that they went to Clemson and uh, some other schools up in the Carolinas, and they were like, yeah, we're, we're going to go hunt, uh, hunt the Delta this winter. We're going to hit the Mississippi Delta, and then we're going, we're going to go to Stuttgart, Arkansas, and we're going, we're going to have a time over winter break. You should come with us. And I was like, dang, y'all are coming all the way to my neck of the woods. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, yeah, people do travel, especially young people too. I mean, mm-hmm. people people love to come to this part of the world and, and, and be able to hunt and see be, see what experiences they can get all over the country. Mm-hmm. So it's incredible to see just meet the people that from all over. So. I bet you that's one of the, I say I bet you because, you know, I I would love to have the data. I bet you that's one of the biggest things that has changed is people's willingness to travel and the the, the frequency and with which they travel and the distance they go and the amount of time they spend doing that. I think it's a great thing because we're talking about waterfowl here. It's a migratory resource. Mm-hmm. It depends on landscapes all the way from Alaska and um, Carrick Lake, the Queen Maud Gulf, all the way down to the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico. Mm-hmm. And I don't think you can really appreciate those connections until you go there. And you, you realize you're hunting the same birds. If you go to Kansas, mm-hmm. if you go to Lake St. Clair in Michigan, if you go to Pacific Northwest, I mean, those are all North American birds. They come from different mm-hmm. regions mm-hmm. and all that type of stuff. They're all connected on this continent. And by traveling yeah. and seeing those different places, I think people develop a greater appreciation for that. And I think it probably builds some of that network, that broader uh, broader network of, of, of hunters. Oh, sure. That's another great thing about Ducks Unlimited is just the connection you can make all over the country. I know we went to third term in Memphis this past, this past summer. And we met people from all over the country that just, they were like, well, yeah, man, just, just, I'll give you my phone number, hit us up. You can come up to, you know, Iowa or something, come hunt, just come hunt with us. And so (laughs) now the, the, uh, the young people that you meet through this organization, particularly in the, in the opportunities you get are just amazing. So Mike, when you hear these types of programs, um, what do you think? what it could have been for you in college if these types of programs existed even for like like you were doing your undergrad what, what did you do your undergrad here yeah it was wildlife ecology it started as forestry with a wildlife major by the time I got to my senior year we had added the uh, a bachelor's of science in mm-hmm. wildlife ecology okay. yeah I think so that was the first group that even in amongst that like science community like having different but now there's like just different things all over the place where you so can meet one another it mm-hmm so now you're talking about like adding things. WFA is now has tons of things. They mm-hmm. have t- so many different things like you can concentrate in. So I mean that's always changing too. Just I mean, I bet you could go down a list. Everything you were here to where I was here is just yeah crazy the differences. For the listeners, uh, WFA means wildlife, fisheries, <laughs> and aquaculture. <laughs> yeah. That's a very popular yeah. major here at Mississippi State. Yeah. So yeah. 
Derek, I'd have probably been one of the people on the couch. I, I don't. <laughs> I think it would have probably accelerated my appreciation for those connections, and for it would have accelerated my ability to network with other people in the hunting community, build those connections. Uh, I, you know, I built my connections in the scientific community and research community as I got into graduate school. But building those connections with a hunting community has taken much, much longer, um, and at least outside the, the my professional colleagues. But yeah, I'd probably be one of these one of these guys sitting here on this couch. I think the other thing that I see now, and I continue to be impressed by, is how well spoken and how much more comfortable younger folks are today than what I was back then i i would imagine social media has plays a role in that i mean you 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 put yourself on video all the time whenever you're communicating with your friends i'm still a little uneasy about doing some of that but you know snapchat or or a little selfie or whatever for for younger folks i mean that's that's just the way you communicate Mm -hmm. and for for me it's still a little a little different so i i think you know as much as we wring our hands about the ills that can come along with with social media i mean you can say that about any kind of any form or platform of communication i think there's also a lot of good things about it and how it's for a lot of people it's made them more comfortable in the different communication settings at least that's my unofficial take on it but i i i I don't that's the way i see it Mm -hmm. i I think we're we're definitely a lot more used to it we're kind of it's kind of a hardwired into us to that uh the world's a little more interconnected than it, than it was a, even a generation ago, but I know for me and Drew, we're both pretty outgoing people. So I think I think we were both pretty excited about this podcast. <laughs> but uh, to just being involved with DU and other organizations on campus and stuff like that, there's I mean, there's tons of ways to just put yourself out there, and so we are we're always excited for stuff like this. That's so. good. Mm-hmm. One thing you mentioned, Mike, was. Uh, the hunting and the hunting community and kind of the science community. Uh, one thing I learned these last couple of years doing our collegiate kind of research tours, kind of what I called it is on social media, these science communities and these hunting communities are, you think they're kind of, well, they definitely are related, but the people within them are very kind of distant. Um, and so bridging that gap is something that we're trying to do and something that even ducks unlimited is, obviously been doing for a very long time but now this year um and you guys didn't even hunter and drew didn't even know about this uh beforehand but so ducks unlimited has this project called duck dna well i've heard of it i didn't know we had it like on the scene (laughs) oh yeah we got we got we got a kit here so mike would you like to uh sure share a little bit about yeah Yeah, let me set up for this (laughs) and i'll just say that was it outstanding segue Derek um so yeah this one actually you enrolled you know we we had a number of these these things that that we um we assigned to people in our organization like you and me and and uh, Mallory Murphy our social media uh, manager and a few other folks that interact with a lot of different groups to kind of help us spread the word about these uh, and, and get feedback so what duck dna is first i'll just tell folks you can go to our website duckdna.com there's some write ups there about what it is and how people can get involved in it it's it, Derek to your point the way Ducks Unlimited is viewing this is fundamentally our role in connecting researchers with the hunters. We've talked a lot um, in our organization about the role that hunters play in in like in providing data for the management of waterfowl populations through um, through reporting your bands when you when you harvest a, a banded bird or participating in harvest surveys whenever you're asked to do so, um, and. I'm trying to think. Well, it seems like there's one big, big one that I'm missing. But basically, harvest surveys and band recoveries, and and then participating in other ways as well with, re- with research. And so we know hunters are really, really keen to do that. We know hunters get real geeky about the birds they shoot and want to know all about them. So we wanted to take advantage of this to kind of uh, connect hunters with geneticist, a genetics researcher at University of Texas, El Paso, Dr. Phil Lavretsky. He's one of our leading waterfowl geneticists, and there's a lot of technological advances that have occurred in, in genetics these days, and they're able to extract a lot more information from, uh, from, uh, from tissue, from genetic material. So 
This program was launched this year. We're enrolling, have enrolled about 300 participants. We're asking those participants to submit tissue samples from five ducks that they harvest. We've been, uh, I'll show this here, there's a little infographic in there, and five vials in this kit that, that comes with it. Uh, people would go to duckdna.com and they would apply to be part of the program. We had over 4,000 applicants this year. Um, we were able to select only 300 of them because mm -hmm. there's limited capacity, limited resources. It is It has been free for, for people to participate. This has been underwritten, cost of this underwritten by some of our philanthropic donors. We appreciate them very much. They're acknowledged on our website as well. Uh, so, yeah, the way this worked is that we selected hunters in two, in two different rounds, late Octo no, mid-October and then late November, and they have been submitting samples, been uh, taking what, – what, all we do is cut – request that we cut a quarter inch from the tongue of a harvested duck, focusing on mallards, black ducks, model ducks, Mexican ducks, and, and then inter any interesting hybrid. And – we are, yeah, you, you then put them in these vials, and you put them in the freezer, and it includes return shipping label, return postage, instructions here. The other thing that comes with this is you enter the information. When you, when you cut a sample, cut the tissue from the duck's tongue, you go online to your account. You know, when you're selected to participate, you were... You were directed to a, to a website where you create your account, and then for each of these, each of the um, samples that you submit, you answer a number of questions like, "What was the date of the harvest? It was a, uh, where was it harvested? Um, was it a male? Was it a female? Was it a? Do you know if it's an adult or a juvenile? What habitat was it in? And a few other questions, and and so then you know you submit that. So we have, basically, what that does is link some data to your sample mm -hmm. and then you ship it off to UTEP and then they do the analysis and then in about four to six weeks we actually ran a little late on ran behind on this first round of, of analyses we're learning the ropes learning a few things we've got some of that smoothed out the hunter receives a certificate for each mm -hmm. piece each tissue that they submit it tells the um, sort of the genetically vetted species identification if there if it was if the genetic material matches more than one species, it can identify what those are. Is is that looking at game farm mallards? And that's part of it. It that's is one okay. of the questions. I've, yeah. I so that that's one of the more pressing, um, one of the more prevalent issues in this mm -hmm. field of genetics, and that's kind of is one of the main reasons why we. I should say that's one of the main research questions that our mm -hmm. that waterfowl geneticists are, are looking at right now is this. The presence of game farm mallard genes in in the birds that we shoot, and it it it's game farm mallard genes are very prevalent in birds harvested in the Atlantic Flyway. They're pretty prevalent in mallards harvested. I said birds maybe, but in mallards harvested in the Atlantic Flyway, prevalent in mallards harvested in the Great Lakes region. And the farther west you go, there's a, a lower incidence of game farm mallard genes and so that's one of the one of the primary re research questions that are trying to be answered there's a host of other questions but du is primarily just acting as a connector mm -hmm. between researchers and the hunters the response from hunters this year has been has been pretty remarkable i get all sorts of Instagram messages mm -hmm. now and emails we have an email uh, website or an email address set up for this but the level of support and excitement from the hunters and just the, the, uh, how badly people want to participate in this is really mm -hmm. surprising. We've had people offering to pay to be part of this. Um, we've had people kind of making their case, promising that they will collect high-quality samples. But, you know, we've, we've kept it outside of the folks like Derek and a few others within the organization that we've wanted to share these with uh, for this kind of – uh, the, these type of promotional opportunities, it's been it's been largely random. We're taking, um, I guess, by the time this airs, we'll probably be outside the duck season. Okay. But right now, we are collecting or, or taking uh, samples from hybrid birds. If somebody shoots a hybrid bird, they can get in in touch with us, and we'll send them a single vial, 
and then they'll uh, we'll run the analysis for them. So yeah, and and see that's cool because like I had no idea that that was even like a thing, and like I know so many people that would be so interested in doing it. Yeah. So and like like you said, this was like kind of like not really a trial run, but like still trying to figure it's out a pilot. How to, yeah, yeah, for sure. And like it, there's so much research you could get from doing it, and it, it's only going to grow from here. It's it so. it it can go. It's just like 23 and me, right? The, the more information you get on like the behavioral characteristics or the morphology or the habitat associations, who knows what else um, that you get from a bird and then you have also the genetic information from that bird, the greater the opportunity to link these uh, different parts of the genome to what the bird is doing, maybe where it is. That's one of the other things that I'm sure we'll look at as we get go through time. Are there any kind of genetic signatures that are unique to birds let's say mallards that go to the south atlantic mallards that go to south louisiana in october or mallards that go to um go to texas in january you know the the space and time kind of nature of waterfowl migration and are there any genetic is any of that genetically controlled and can we can we identify? It's going to take a large number of samples, right? Absolutely. We've got a few other things to work out, but this is the start of it. The response has been overwhelming, and hopefully we shoot some mallards, maybe a black duck. Maybe yeah, a that, yeah, that black duck's coming in the morning. <laughs> Watch, he gonna, and, and he we will take it's care of this. We will we'll submit it there. You know, Inside this each of these vials is some a buffer solution, which kind of per, uh, prevents the degradation of the DNA material uh, until it can – you, you we put it in here, a little quarter inch piece of the tongue, put it in here, put this in the freezer until we're ready to ship it back. And then and that's it. We haven't had any problems. We, I think we've had maybe one or two samples that have failed analysis. Mm-hmm. Sometimes that happens. But the fact that we've, we've had such high success rate thus far tells us that this buffer solution is really good. Uh, had really good performance, even with all the, you know, the vagaries of how mm-hmm. hunters handle these things. Oh, and yeah, absolutely. It's, it's been pretty good been actually really really good so what do you guys think about that (laughs) (laughs) i'm hoping that black duck flies over in the morning is what i I think but uh no like i think it's i I think it's like like who would have ever thought that like this was like a like would even be a thing it just it goes to show that like if there's enough people that like care about it and there's enough people that will like actually put forth like the effort to do something like this how how much information we could actually learn from, yeah. from something like this program. And, and we don't know long-term what the management implication is for this. There have been some additional studies looking to see, uh, to answer the, okay, so what? All right, so these birds have game farm mallard genes in them. Big deal, right? There have been some work, and actually Brian Davis from here at Mississippi State has been involved in some of this work, looking at some of the difference, morphological differences, physiological differences uh, between pure wild mallards and game farm mallards or game farm hybrid mallards and they have found some preliminary differences in uh, in, in certainly in lamellar spacing you know the the comb like structures on, on on the bill that helps birds helps ducks forage um, the bill length wing shape and also some preliminary differences in like their ability to put on fat and also some uh, some of these other studies that are using gps tracking devices so here's 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 what you can kind of think about if you have these birds with gps tracking devices on them and if you have the genetic material associated with that you have all this data on on movement on, on the timing of migration the location of their movements what kind of habitat they're using um and that gives you all sorts of opportunity to link those behaviors with some genetic, some piece of the genetic code. And so they have found in some, some preliminary work has, has identified some differences in the way game farm hybrids move about the landscape versus pure wild mallards. A lot of this will need to be replicated and substantiated before you can really have any, um, you know, strong inference for, moving forward with any kind of management recommendation even if you could if, if you could like we're talking about a lot of wild and mm-hmm. uh, free-ranging animals mm-hmm. you know it's even yep, imagining absolutely. a management action that would be effective is kind of challenging but anyway it's we're we're trying to just help collect the data and then the researchers will be the ones to look into all those questions and then the 
the management agencies charged with decisions that would intersect any of this information would you know get involved if they want to i think this is great is me coming from less of a biologist side and more of like a you know trying to manage an organization try to recruit people has a lot of the questions we get all the time as well yeah y'all 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 hunt ducks and and you said we're raising money we're doing these events what what are some of the things y'all do and something like this would be perfect to say well i as a hunter i can do something this simple and and ducks unlimited can collect data points from from something you know we harvested as hunters just while we were out doing our thing so i think that's incredible for us just as you know regular people trying to organize this chapter so yeah and and i'll say this about the whole you talking about gps but like even like bands like i would hope everybody that kills a band would report it but like some people just like don't and and like that's crazy to like think about like if you had to think like what percent I know this is gonna be like a crazy question, but like, what percentage of ducks do you think get banded? Oh gosh, I have no idea. <laughs> like, it, it's got to be a lo- like an it's, it's very very insanely low, low yeah. number. I, w- I was actually lucky enough to this summer band a bunch of wood ducks and wilson ducks in the refuge, and the survivability of those ducks, like you would never think, because I would say just under fifty percent of the birds that we would pull out of a box would already be banded hmm. from the the These previous hens that you're the hens yeah, yes yeah. sir that we were pointing out of the box so like that just goes to show like even that you ban that don't mean that you're gonna find out so like even the ones that you are banning not all of them are even found so just like hunter's responsibility of when you are lucky enough and privileged enough to kill something like that you take the little bit of initiative to go online and type it in you Abs- know what i'm saying yeah absolutely yeah one of the things and this is a question for brian for dr brian davis because he studied wood ducks for many many years but so you you have a sample of birds that are banded that you're pulling from the nest box, right? Yes, that sir. you're that you're encountering. I'm curious what percentage of those that you encounter that are banded in the nest box are act or subsequently encountered via a hunter harvest. You know, I, you, I, you'd I, you'd have to think, and I don't know what that is. I suspect Brian or others researchers have kind of calculated and that. With but. us, like I say, with us hunting with us doing everything at the refuge, I wish there was like. At the refuge, like a banded, like if you kill a band, please just write a tally mark on this so we can try to, like we banded, I think we banded like fifty something. So like if we banded like fifty two, well only seventeen get killed. There's, you know, however many left over. So I just wish there was a way to figure out like how many are actually being killed. But who knows if they're even staying on the refuge? Well, we do. Uh, I say we. The the research community and management community does use reward bands. We mm-hmm. tr- we do use methods to estimate reporting rate, mm-hmm. and and that those reward bands are a way that we uh, that they estimate that. And I forget what it's the current reporting rate estimate is somewhere in the neighborhood of eighty percent. Which or take, which is good, uh, like but that. Uh, yeah. But but yeah, to your point. We encourage everyone, every chance we get, if you encounter a banded bird, yeah, report it. I mean, that's that's useful data. Here, here's a funny story. I was able to, I was lucky enough to kill one this year, and I was working at the store. And my coworker said, "Man, I, I killed one too." And I was like, "Where's it from?" He goes, "Iowa." I was like, "Mine was from Iowa." Yeah. I was like, "Where?" The same guy. We we pulled up our safety. The same guy banded. Both of our ducks, except mine was born two years before his yeah. was. Well, now, so here's something I'll, I'll, I'll share with you. Not to say that the person listed on, the, on there wasn't the one that physically banded. It could have been, but a lot of times states will have a master bander listed And then people on the will permit, be under him? And then they'll have sub okay. permittees. So it could be a situation like that. Uh, Oren Jones, was that his – Was that? do you remember if that was the I'm name? not sure. It was, on, it was like on a lake. Yeah, okay. he lived like on a lake. I don't know. It could have been. Yeah. But anyway, but but a lot of people will. Um, that's the intuitive way to interpret those bands or those certificates. But for some states, they will have a master bander, and then they'll have a lot of different sub permittees, and so. Um, but still, yeah, it's really still cool. for a while. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's it's right. Still, it's still, cool still crazy. Yeah. But yeah, that I, I would imagine that wood ducks are one of the more interesting returns that people down here get anyway, because you mm-hmm. grow up. I mean, during the summer, you see wood ducks all the time, right? Mm-hmm. And then when winter comes around, you shoot a wood duck. 
it's from Iowa. I mean, mm-hmm. wood ducks will yeah. migrate, right? Yeah. A lot of folks, I don't know. It's just one. It's a local breeder, but then a lot of the birds that you get later in the in the in the winter are going to be wood ducks that have migrated in from other regions, and that's a species that we're still learn trying to learn about in terms of some of those some of those migratory movements. It's also crazy to see the variability in the flyways. Like I was in class the other day, and me and this guy were walking. He's like, "You ever kill any wood ducks down here?" I kind of looked at him like, <laughs> "Are you crazy?" Yeah. I was like, man, I was like, there are too many of them. I, I'll be honest. He's like, dude, it is my dream to kill a wood duck. I was like, where no are you way. from? He goes, like, the upper parts of Texas. I was like, so what do you make? Yeah. He was like, pintails. We go Sand Hill Crane hunting yeah, all the time. that's right. Yeah, I was like, yeah, no big deal. Like, whatever. <laughs> I was like, dude, that is, like, crazy compared to – but, like, that was his dream was – he said, I want to kill a wood duck so bad. And so there's the value in yeah. making these connections oh, yeah. with hunters yeah. from yeah. different parts of the world. It's like, hey, you come hunting with me. I'll get you on a wood yeah. duck. You well, just get we... me on a pintail and a yeah. crane. We yeah. can make a deal. Yeah. You, yeah. Ne- you we'll, never we'll expect it. You, it's yeah. like I said earlier, people come from all over to hunt these, any Mississippi, any part of the country, people will go anywhere. So it's incredible to see. Yeah. Yep, yep. Derek, anything else about this? We wanted to cover. We'll, we'll uh, hopefully we'll get to put that thing in use today. I actually uh, put four pieces of tissue and some vials that I had today, so I was happy about that. Perfect. Season's winding down, and and so uh, yeah, hopefully we get as many of these things in it as possible. Yeah, no, I'm hoping Camus Waterfall can contribute to some of this research here, yeah, and you absolutely. guys can get get a certificate possibly yeah. from it. Yep. So uh, I given- appreciate y'all. Appreciate y'all letting us talk about this and and uh being a part of it yeah yeah we definitely hope to help that's our why we all do ducks unlimited is to be able to just play a small part in mm-hmm. research and stuff like that we i try to tell people i have people approach me on campus that maybe aren't duck hunters or just don't hunt at all and they say like well how are y'all for the environment if you if you kill animals and we're like I hate to break it to you, but hunters are the—they're the original environmentalists. Right. You know, there's nobody that cares more than we do, and so anytime guys like us get an opportunity to even do something like that, it's—it's—it's it's, it's exciting. It's very exciting. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. What's what do you say to them when they as a part of that conversation? I, because I've I, I, my my response is usually I just tell I talk about the so a lot of the stuff the work that DU does a lot of the research. I just say that. Uh, if you if you look and see the people who are doing the most research as far as wildlife as far as you know environmental science forestry agriculture i mean they're all they're hunters they're people that they they take they re, they sow and they reap from the land you know so that that's what i like to show people also a lot of people don't realize how much money ducks Limited puts to the breeding grounds because without the breeding grounds there's there's no birds to 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 even move down yeah. so i mean there is so stupid amounts of money going to the breeding grounds in canada and i mean ducks Lemon does work all up and down the united states i mean it, there's i've seen pictures and data and so many things of just where all ducks Lemon is putting their money and it's it's all over Stupid. It may be stupid amounts of money going to the breeding grounds, but it's still not enough. No, absolutely yeah. not. Stu- <laughs> stupid, not enough. stupid amounts of money raised by volunteers. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And and that I, that's a wonderful thing about this organization is it's all people that just really care enough to put the work in. Yeah. And so that's why we are. That's why we do this chapter. That's why all the local chapters and all across the country do it. Yeah. So I've had the opportunity the past few weeks to visit with several folks that have not hunted before. And I was able to participate to to help introduce a couple of those to hunting. That's a really special uh, special thing to do. But we were talking with them about the value of hunters and um, the the financial contributions that come from license sales, whether it be state license sales, WMA permits, refuge permits, the federal duck stamp. Everyone age 16 years or older is required to have one of those, and that's one of the most effective conservation investments that any person could ever make is purchasing a federal duck stamp. You don't have to be a hunter to do that. Um, anybody can can do that. But every hunter, by virtue of buying a license, buying those stamps, a state waterfowl stamp from many different states, they have contributed to conservation. And when you go and harvest a bird and spend your time and spend your resources chasing these birds and sweating and and being frustrated <laughs> and falling down hills and then the reward on like let's say a, a hopefully a morning like tomorrow it it gives you a connection. I was explaining this to a guy just the other day. 
it's hard to explain. It's hard to explain in words, but when you see people experience it, you know, for the most for the most part, there are some folks that try it and they don't like it. It's just not for them, and that's fine. But the people that do get it, it's like a switch that's flipped, and it's like I can't really put words to that, but there's some visceral feeling and appreciation for that, and it it causes you to care about that resource to a to a degree that that I, I most folks that have been trying to explain it would simply say you, you just can't get from a lot of other experiences yeah. at a on as consistent of a level as you get from one hunter to the next well as a as an outdoorsman you especially from a young age you kind of grow a love for it especially from the camaraderie that comes from it but i joke with my dad and my family a lot that as as land managers and conservationists sometimes we take better care of the land and the animals than we do of ourselves you know (laughs) we're losing sleep and we're skipping meals and stuff to go get out in the woods and chase these things but yeah, we, every, most most hunters, most responsible hunters you meet, really, really care about the land and and what they and what they have from it. So it, it, it's pretty rare that you meet a hunter that that just is extremely irresponsible and and that does not care about the the land and the animals. So, yep. Well, we're kind of approaching an hour slowly here. Yeah. Um, it goes by fast. It does. <laughs> yeah. It goes by quick when you're having fun. Uh, let's talk about tomorrow's more tomorrow morning. Time. Let's talk about it. Let's get into. It. All right. So what, what do we got? <laughs> you got it, Drew. We got. We just uh, talked about getting excited as hunters. Yeah. Right? Here yeah. We go. I know. This was this was my thing. All right. So um, we're gonna put the boats in tomorrow. We're gonna travel across. I'll run in, sign in real quick. We'll we'll head down, climb up the bank. We're we're, we're in like bank. East Central Mississippi. Yep. The hot the duck mecca of the place to be <laughs> let me right. tell you what. uh there are ducks over here there yeah, are ducks really over here. there um chance of rain in the morning that that i don't know I, I don't know how i feel about it it could be good could we'll see we'll we'll stay a little bit later to see if they won't fly after the yeah. rain that uh the place we're going to is it's down probably we're in a bad drought so it hasn't two years ago it was full it has not been full since two years ago so but i'm thinking Last time we hunted it, it was just about to where it was about to get back up in the trees. So I'm hoping with this amount of rain we got, which was a ton, um, is it'll be about shin to knee deep, and that way we can hide in the brush and they should be coming right on top of us. That's if we have them here. I mean, I'm hope so. We were locked up bad uh, the past what f- probably four days ago. I mean, you you could have gone out there ice skating with it, probably. Yeah. Um, so. Hopefully we catch them on the way back up. That's that's kind of what I'm thinking. Um, but we normally shoot pretty good when it's 45, 38 degrees. Is that so, what it's going to be in the morning? I think 48. I need to look at that. No, not 48. I think it's going to be like right around 40, I think. Yeah, you're going to be touching 40s, lower 50s, yeah. stuff like that, okay. later in the day, not early in the morning. But, yeah. but um, this is this is a place I, I would say that if we were going to be anywhere, this is where we need to be. This um, is like scrub shrub. It's a uh, it's a uh, bunch of buck brush, button bush in there. There's acorns over the slough, so there's acorns dropping there. I mean, this is we hunted the other day, and we hunted one side, and then of course they wanted the other, and <laughs> they hit the water and wah, 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 in the corner, just like come it. But like the 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 good thing about the slough is that if you're on one side, you can shoot groups going over, and then they'll just pitch down on on the back side. Like we would shoot, and then five minutes like. Wah, wah, in the corner so it's cool i mean they're they're in there um we just got to hope they're in there in the morning mostly mallards what do we what so, species should we expect teal are notorious for coming in there okay okay when well. the gadwall are here they're in there when the mallards are here they're in there um it's just it, it's got it's got deep water it's got shallow water it's got food it's got places to roost i mean i've walked in the mornings so i had geese that flew over me from walking in i mean it's got every in my eyes i mean we may get in the morning you're like this place sucks but like it's got <laughs> it's got everything that Guaranteed you would think you a, a, a duck would would want i mean it's it's like 400 yards long just in the middle where i'm hoping there's water now was dry so it's like in the middle it comes up and then it just drops off so there's water on both sides buck brush all the way down the middle um so was it totally dry this summer so it wasn't totally dry but like normally all right the first time we hunted it we were walking through 
waist deep water the whole way. Is it what, mucky bottom? What's her bottom pretty, like? Pretty hard bottom. Pretty, I mean, okay. pre- pretty good bottom. But right now, like when we walk in the morning, bone dry. Should be. Okay. I mean, now I I hope it's deep because the deeper it is, they can swim in that brush. They can do whatever. But um, the, it should. I hope, man. It's with this rain that we got. It should be up enough to where we can stand in the brush and then they. they so you're not concerned about it being too deep then? No, not at all. Okay. Now, if you if we shoot one out in the dead middle, we're gonna be somebody gonna be swimming. Okay. But besides that, I mean, it's. But we'll ha- well, that's right. We won't have a boat in there, will we? That's mm-hmm. right. We take a boat kind of to the bank. We had There's a boat an in there. Adventurous bank that I'm looking forward to. Apparently, yeah. right? We we, right. we we had drug a boat. We drug a boat up there, and we drug it from where we're going to step in all the way to where. And like, I'll stop us in the morning. We're like, this is where the water started, because like, I remember it like it was yesterday. It was we didn't sleep at all that night. We went out there at twelve o'clock. We're like, we gotta go. We got a lot of stuff to do. So we pulled up the boat, drug it through there. And then put put it in, and it took us probably an hour and a half. Cause we'd never been in there before. We didn't know anything. We well, I take that back. We teal hunted it that year, and there was probably three hundred blue wings in there. I mean, just last weekend of blue wing. I mean, just tons of them. So we we're like, we can come in here, we can hunt this, and that's when the water was up, of course. And we pushed a boat in there because I mean, buck brush and everything. Mm-hmm. Now I got a cut trail. I mean, it's it's. The best it's probably ever looked in there. Okay. Uh, getting there wise, it's not bad. It's not a bad walk. I mean, it'll be interesting. It, I enjoyed it. I do it. Yeah, hey, I'm it's, game. It's Ready fun. Go. Y'all are gonna be in good hands. <laughs> Drew is a heck of a guy. So you're not going? I will not be there in the morning. Uh, our our good friend, uh, one of our members, Cooper Little, will be replacing me. I'll, I've uh, I've got to go out of town tomorrow. But uh, hmm. yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> well, we'll miss you. Yeah, but it's nice talking to y'all tonight. And uh, this is. This is his home territory. I'm not quite from up here, but this is his home territory, so y'all are going to be in good hands. So, yeah. It sounds a lot like a place where I, the places where I grew up, the hunting the scrub shrub and button willow. Is there cypress trees in there? Everywhere. Yeah, yeah. It sounds a lot like that, uh, places where it's, it Like, if they're not there, we're going to look and be like. That's why it's called hunting. Yeah, I don't know. That's why it's called hunting. Yep. yep. But, I mean, there's been mornings that we go in there and, Watch a couple and walk out with two, and then sometimes yeah. we get in there, we'll walk out with twenty, twenty-five. Yeah. I, I remember last year, um, it was a family hunt, and I brought my dad, my granddad. My granddad got up the hill, so you'll be fine. <laughs> um, <laughs> we no uh, ain't worried about me. We got everybody up there. <laughs> the old <laughs> guy in the crowd, but you know, I'll be I think, all right. I think it was it was the week the last weekend is when it was, and we killed a six man. Everybody ran out of shells. Uh, hmm. Just crazy. I mean, we were picking up birds. Birds were still in the air. Then we went back in there. We skipped class on Tuesday and went back in there, and we killed a four. Mm-hmm. So the last two hunts of the year, which is right now a year ago, I mean they were you couldn't keep them off of you. So if we just have a little bit of that in the morning, man, it'll be it'll be so much fun. And we'll have, we nobody has anything to do, so we can stay a little bit later too. Yeah. Yeah. Get the get the get the second flight in. Yeah. I'm bringing the grill. I have biscuits going. Are you serious? Oh, oh I'm mean on that grill. All right, here we yeah. go. All right. Now we don't take anything lightly around here. Uh, <laughs> we we have a fun time out at the, the duck camps around here, and I'll say this for some of my more national people listening: that Mississippi is a sportsman's paradise. Whether you're in the the Delta or the the hills or the the Pine Belt, it's a it's a there's great ducks, deer, turkey everywhere. So. I highly recommend coming down here to Mississippi State and seeing us sometime. Snipe. I, I hear you can even shoot some snipe around here mm-hmm. in Mississippi. I, I, I have to get my snipe comment in. Yeah. I've been shooting some snipe lately. Uh-huh. I've seen that on, on your Instagram. Like, what in the world? <laughs> shooting shorebirds, man. Yeah. The right kind of shorebirds, the, the ones uh, that you're allowed to shoot. Yeah. So how upset are you going to be if we – If I don't know how many, I don't even know how many people we're going to have in there, but how, how upset are you going to be if, if you get the, we the photo him. and we just yeah. we smash I'll, I'll be okay. I you'll, prom- you'll, be, you'll be happy for I'll, us. I'll, it'll probably bother me for a couple of days, and then I'll be okay. I promise you. I uh, Yeah. <laughs> I'm just, yeah. right. I'm just, I'm just here to be a pretty face on the camera. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, as we, uh, as we kind of wind down, I just wanted to give y'all a little, uh, little souvenir from our chapter. I've had sent in my pocket for the last two hours, but <laughs> no way. here's oh, a little yeah. Man, bulldog chapter, bulldog chapter, ducks unlimited koozie. Wow. Just a Thank little, you very much. sort of a token, just a yeah. little token of appreciation for y'all coming down here and seeing Love us. Uh, 
hopefully y'all come back. We we will be hosting our first ever concert for conservation presented by Mossy Oak. Uh, we're going to have Sam Barber come down to Rick's Cafe, and he's going to play a private acoustic concert awesome. for us. Hopefully, we hope this is our biggest event ever, and hopefully y'all come back and see us sometime. So. What are the dates on that? March 19th. March 19th. All right, yep. I'll get those dates from you here once we get off. I'll put it in my in my, in my calendar. Yep. I don't – I'm not – don't have my calendar memorized well enough to know if I got anything there, but I'd love to come back. And man, thank you for this. This is cool. Look, yeah, I mean, absolutely. best color too. We, we, room, yeah, right? we, oh, yeah. we can probably slide you in the back door. <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. I do I have a question you. though. We free get shells in the morning? Yeah, I brought a whole case. I got a whole case for you guys. You That's what I'm that. talking about. No, Kent ain't Cartridge that. hooked you guys up. Yeah, Kent, man, that, that ain't that ain't no joke right here. <laughs> no, that ain't no, no joke. <laughs> two yeah. fours, too, man. Yeah. They, two four stack. I've been hearing yeah. a lot of good things from the students. Yeah. They've been they've been enjoying them all season. So well, hopefully that black duck flies over. That's right. You got me. F- I, I know he's gonna be on edge like all, <laughs> yeah. all there's all that black duck right there. He's like no that man. Black I, I'm just glad we're all getting to go, man. I'm I'm really blessed to be able to do and have the. The access and do something like this and when i when the opportunity presented itself man i was like i i would love love to do it and i'm, I'm glad you made the trip down yeah. and we're gonna have the whole thing on video we're gonna have a good time mm-hmm. regardless but you're you're staying sunday too right correct yep and so then we'll i'm taking off tomorrow afternoon yep, yep. okay so, so heading back we'll figure gonna, something gonna out try to do sunday gonna try too. to do some more hunting um up in my kind of home stomping okay. grounds so well I like to do that sort of towards the end of the season so all right. I don't blame you. All right. mm-hmm. but. Well, I don't. I don't really want to ask you guys the question: What you're going to do after duck season? I don't really want to think about it. Just Shoot a turkey in the mouth. All right, there you go. <laughs> I'm gonna go watch some baseball. That's what I'm gonna do. Baseball. Baseball is our big sport around. Yeah, how's here, Mississippi so. State looking this year? <laughs> <laughs> we we came off that national championship a couple of years ago. We're still living on that, right? Yeah, yeah. we're still we're still <laughs> kind of still kind of living on top of that, but. Hopefully we have a good uh, good baseball season down here, and it's a fun time, I tell you what. So yep. that's what I'll be doing after duck season. I am proud to say that I was in Omaha for the national. I also I was there. Were you? It was incredible. Man, I had I, I did not want to miss it, and I didn't miss it, and man, it was it was amazing. Was, and it hasn't been hasn't really been amazing since. That was one of those moments of where performance on the field. <laughs> that was one of those moments where you were just out all night and you just never wanted it to end. But, no, I think oh, I yeah. pretty much was out all night. Yep. Well, <laughs> I'll tell you this too, what you said about um, what we're going to do after season. We've got we've got some pretty big things in the works for, for next year. We're talking about putting culverts in and taking a track down there and clearing some stuff out. So, mm. you know, this year, like one of my best holes last year did not get water till January 8th. Wow. Hmm. Like, we would go in there. We'd kill 15 or 20 just about every time. You could go in there every day if you wanted to. Did not have water January 8th. So, we're going to try to implement culverts to that was raise it. This year? Or this, la- this okay. year. Okay, yeah. Like, you could have drove – I could have drove my truck all yeah. in, and oh, it yeah. would have been fine. Yeah, it's I was, just crazy. I was, was going to show you those pictures earlier where mm-hmm. two weeks ago I was in North Mississippi, and it was bone dry – and right now, there's three feet of water in it, which is where it needs to be. I mean, mm-hmm. that's, it's probably similar to the yep. type of habitat where we're going to be tomorrow. Yep. yep. So, yep. It, it, should, it should be – tomorrow, it should be – the water depth should be about, I'm hoping – Yeah, I mean, that's a better needed, depth. Which yeah. would be – but it's hard to hide in buck brush when you don't have water. Yeah. It, oh, yeah. You, you can't do it. But now, when we hunt two years ago, where we where I want to stand in the morning, and when it was waist deep, you could hunker down, and you're fine because your legs weren't yep. there. But – have a backup plan if we can't go there. We can help sit on the side of the the tree line and and hide pretty good. But um, it should be good, man. I'm I'm fired up. It should be we should do all right. Good deal. Well, thank you guys for yeah. everything oh, thank that you, you man. do. Thank you, man. I well, appreciate it. Well, thank you for the hunt tomorrow, but thank you for everything. More importantly, for that you do for Ducks Unlimited. Oh yeah, Again, y'all are the y'all are uh, y'all are what make us go. Absolutely, we, we love it. We love it every minute of it. That's why we put in the time we do, and we we keep doing it year after year. So yeah. All right. You guys all good? I'm good if you're good. Hey, I'm all good. right. Well, thank you, Derek, for thank inviting you, me you're on this. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. No, I, I love getting the opportunity to do this, and uh, it's sad to say that this is going to be our last trip for this duck season, but it's not over yet. There's, yeah. We're going to be doing some yeah. hunting this spring. Yep. Oh, yeah. So, uh, But that's going to do it here at Mississippi State. Thank you guys again. Thank you. Stay tuned for this upcoming video. We gave you guys kind of what we're, what we're expecting mm-hmm. for the morning, but – see how it goes in our next video so that's going to do it here with the campus waterfowl podcast we'll see you in the next one hell state yeah come on with it go dogs